Hello and welcome everyone to today's session, which is being offered in its part of the Extra Executive Training Program and Spotlight Series. I'm Maria Judd, Vice President with the recently amalgamated organization of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Our Spotlight Series are an opportunity to shed light on and discuss ways of addressing the most pressing challenges in healthcare across Canada. And today's session, Indigenous Racism in Healthcare, Getting on a Pathway for Reconciliation is designed to do just that. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize that we're gathering from a number of places across the country. We have almost 400 people on the line with us from every province and several of the territories. I'd also like to recognize that our main offices of the Amalgamated Organization are located on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Treaty 6 peoples. As part of my reconciliation learning journey, I've been taught that a land acknowledgement is an act of reconciliation, that it involves making a statement, recognizing the traditional territory of the Indigenous people who have called land home before the arrival of settlers, and in many cases still do. At this point in time, I invite you to introduce yourself using the chat feature, and I welcome you to reflect on the land from which you're joining us today. I have a few housekeeping items before we dive into our presentations and discussions. First, we're pleased to offer this session in French. So there will be French language simultaneous interpretation for today's event. And you can find the options for language in your menu in Zoom. So you can choose to listen to and participate in today's session in either English or French. We also want to ensure that we're setting up an environment that is safe and supportive for everyone who's gathered today virtually. We recognize that some of the topics that may come up today may be emotionally difficult. And we've arranged for all our participants for an opportunity to connect with during or after uh, a counselor if you wish to debrief. At this point in time, I just invite Kathleen Gorman from Alberta, who is joining us as our counselor, to turn on your camera and say hello. Greetings to everybody. Honored to be here from Treaty 6 territory. Thanks so much, Kathleen for joining us. And if you'd like to reach out or connect with Kathleen, uh, you can do that during the session with her cell phone number, which will be provided in the chat and or during email during or following today's session. Also want to remind everyone that today's session is being recorded and will be made available on our website as a resource following, to, following our live time together today. Today's session is in response to recent events uh, and reports, including but not limited to the very tragic and publicized death of Joyce Eshquan in a Quebec hospital, and the recent report in Plain Sight report addressing Indigenous specific racism in BC healthcare. It's also in response to increasing recognition that systemic racism is an issue in healthcare across Canada. It's a patient safety and quality of care issue and that leaders across the country have a role and responsibility to respond. I'm very grateful to our speakers today who have joined us um, to help in starting, continuing that discussion and understanding how we can respond across the country. I'd like to introduce them now. Dr. Darlene Kitty is the Director of the Physician Indigenous Program at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Medicine, where she leads the efforts at Indigenous student in recruitment and support, as well as Indigenous health curriculum. Dr. Kitty is the former president and a current board member of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada. Honorable Dr. Mary Ellen Turpel Lafon is a senior associate counsel with Woodward and Company. Mary Ellen is a member of Saskatchewan's Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, former Saskatchewan Provincial Court judge, and served in the BC legislature for over a decade as the province's first ever representative for children and youth. She was appointed last June by BC Health Minister Adrian Dix to lead an investigation into Indigenous specific racism in healthcare. And along with our co-presenter, Harmony Johnson, will be sharing the report findings and recommendations during today's session. Harmony Johnson is principal of Har Harmony Johnson Consulting. She is from the Tawagan First Nation, a book author, and has over 15 years of experience in, in senior and executive roles in health, 
First Nations policy, intergovernment relations, and self-governance. Governance. Harmony was an executive director of the study investigating Indigenous racism in BC's health system, which is reflected in the plain sight report you'll hear more about today. Just huge gratitude to our speakers for preparing and joining us, making this session and opportunity possible. Over to you, Darlene. Well, Jeff, uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to uh, your, your attendees on uh, cultural safety, reconciliation, and anti-racism. I'm speaking from just has to be Cree Nation, um, where I work as a family physician most of the time. So I'm bringing a frontline perspective as well as uh, being a, a teacher and advocate for Indigenous health uh, using my medical education hat. So uh, next, next slide, please. So I just like to speak to you uh, at first with giving you some uh, information that hopefully will answer some of the questions in your mind, but also prompt other questions. So we'll talk about cultural safety, reconciliation, anti-racism, look at some historical and current factors that affect indigenous health, and also give you a few resources where you can continue your learning and your journey to reconciliation. First of all, we'll talk about cultural safety. Uh, BC uh, has done a lot of great work with uh, cultural safety training. And uh, from the First Nations Health Authority, uh, they have this nice definition of cultural safety, uh, basically is an outcome based on respectful engagement that recognizes and addresses power imbalances, meaning be between a professional, health professional and a patient, it's not, uh, a different level. It's more an engagement at a, at a, at a partnership rather than a hierarchical relationship. And uh, it also provides an environment free of racism and discrimination, a safe environment for Indigenous patients to interact with the healthcare system. Next. Cultural humility is also an important concept that we must consider. And this basically is based on self-reflection. So knowing that if, if someone needs to learn more information about a certain culture or population, uh, it's better for them so they can understand what that other indigenous patient or culture is experiencing. And as many of you know, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission put out a report in 2015, and out of that, uh, there was some 94 calls to action, seven which are related to health. And next slide, please. In order to advance reconciliation, it's important to learn about the residential school experience, acknowledge the harm that was done, and also take action to make positive change. Next. So here's a picture of the Indian residential schools that were established across Canada. The blue arrow you can see is Chisasabi, where I'm calling from. Uh, we had two residential schools nearby. Most of the residential schools are scattered throughout Western Canada. But in addition to these 130 schools, there was also industrial schools, day schools and boarding schools. Next. So here you can see a picture of some of the uh, schools that uh, were established. The top right is Kamloops, one of the most notorious schools. The bottom left is Fort Capel, Saskatchewan, the last school that closed in 1996, so not so long ago. How ironic is it, is it that the teepees of family members are outside the gates of the school? And the bottom right picture shows the transformation of a uh, young First Nations boy in his regalia. And later on, after being in residential school, how he transformed into a white person. Next. And here's from my, um, my territory, the two residential schools that were nearby. My father went to St. Philip's Anglican Residential School and uh, he was a 
uh, there for eight years. The top left is my uncle and another friend reading a book. So to me, residential school is very personal. Both my parents went to residential school and I'm a residential school intergenerational survivor. Next. So it's important to understand what exactly is the residential school experience. As you know, the Jews, uh, you know, suffered the Holocaust. So this is just as important to understand in the history of Canada. As I mentioned, 130 schools, um, some of those children that were taken away from their families never returned to their families and they were adopted out to non-Indigenous families. And this is called the 60s scoop. The schools were run by the government, but then offloaded to the churches, mostly Roman Catholic and Anglican, but other churches as well. First Nations, Inuit and, and Métis children were, were uh, victims of uh, residential schools. And I call them victims because they suffered many abuses um, and they couldn't speak their language. They couldn't partake in their culture or their traditions. They couldn't even see their siblings. So basically they had been stripped of their identity as a First Nations Inuit or Métis person. Next. So many students suffered emotional, physical and sexual abuse. And over the generations, they've suffered losses of culture, traditions, language, lands, values, parenting skills, loss of family members. Some children died in those schools, sometimes because of disease like influenza or tuberculosis. And sometimes they died of other reasons. And they also lost their community life being away from their parents. This resulted in many mental health and social issues, unresolved grief, and probably contributes to a lot of the things we see today in Indigenous peoples. Some of the challenges they, they face at an individual level, in their family, or at a community level. Next. Some of those mental health issues include depression, suicide, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is not only from the survivors, it affects their families uh, and, and the several generations thereafter. So as I mentioned, we have intergenerational survivors. On the other, on the other hand, despite the tragedies that many families have suffered because of residential schools, we still see the resilience, the strength, the courage and the love. And we do have a variety of, uh, of how much or how little people have coped with this. Uh, so there's a diversity among survivors and their intergenerational uh, survivors as well. Next. So why is it important to know this? Because indigenous populations have the poorest health status, whether it's rural, remote or urban. Many communities are impoverished and suffer uh, big needs such as sanitation, clean water. Um, there's many mental health and social problems, as I mentioned. And the residential schools probably by far are, is the most important factor that affects health. There still remains a large gap of knowledge from healthcare professionals, administrators and politicians. And I believe social, it's a social, moral and ethical responsibility of health professionals, as well as administrators and leaders to understand what is the residential school experience, the health status and other information that's pertinent to reduce health inequities and systemic racism. So these are the social determinants of health. And if you think about your nearby indigenous community you might be able to appreciate how they struggle because of deficits in these uh, social determinants of health. Um, you know, lack of education. Some, some communities have no high school and students have to go elsewhere to, to uh, go to high school. Um, there are big housing issues, sometimes 10, 20 people living in a house. Family and child welfare is a big problem for many nations uh, because of youth protection uh, programs are more geared 
to taking away children from the, uh, from the family rather than trying to resolve the issue in the family. Did you know that there is right now more Indigenous children in the welfare system than there was at the height of the residential school experience? That's something to think about. What are we doing for our children, our Indigenous children? How can you as a healthcare leader support Indigenous families and children? That's something to think about. Also, we know that Aboriginal status, residential schools and racism also affect health. Next. Now I was gonna show you a picture about a slide about health status, but uh, you know, we, since you're all over Canada, uh, I suggest you explore this on your own. But this is one picture from the Cree territory, Iwishi, that shows the prevalence of diabetes over the decades. It was 2.4% in 90, 1983, and you can see how much it climbed up to 2014, 24.6%. So it's 10 times higher and it's largely because of uh, the diet has changed, more sedentary lifestyle, more reliance on cars, for example. So our diabetes and its complications has uh, increased dramatically. But this could be anything. This could be mental health issues. This could be cardiovascular disease, could be obesity. So we think, we, we have to think on having, um, you know, what, what the health status is and how can we change that? Next. Some of the barriers to culturally safe care, again, lack of knowledge. Um, we need to learn about culture, traditions, the beliefs and values of indigenous people. Even the concept of health is different. What about their communities? What are they like? Have you visited a community? What about language? You know, we have to anticipate that indigenous people seeking health care might need some help with language or understanding concepts. It's it's it'd be difficult to understand something happening with the health with a health problem because they're using big words. So we need to communicate effectively. From an administrative point of view, it's important to reduce that power imbalance and see Indigenous people as a, a population that needs your help and not someone up here and patient down here. And we need to consider how funding and treaty rights are, are impacting their access and quality of care. Access again, you know, can be varied depending where you are in Canada, but I think it's important to reflect on to help you improve services for Indigenous communities near you. And also to consider uh, that populate, Indigenous populations also are in urban centres. And again, the big R word, a big, a big barrier there. Next. So think about you as an Indigenous, if you were an Indigenous person, if you were taken away from your family when you were a child, or if you as a parent, think about if your children were taken away. Can you imagine? Next. And while the residential school experience and the sequelae that we see today are very tragic and pervasive. We need to think of Indigenous people in a positive light. Their cultures are still strong. Their connection to the land provides strength for them. So we need to think of Indigenous people as vibrant and thriving. And it's important to think about the history of their communities and understand that. Next. So here are some pictures uh, that show that positive light. Here's me on the on the right, I'm taking a freighter canoe ride up the James Bay coast. Next. Some uh, whitefish being smoked in a traditional style. That's my uncle on the top left, scooping fish from the river. Next. Some young boys sitting down by the riverbank. Next. This is me snowshoeing uh, when I first started practice up in Chisassabee. Next. These are Cree uh, ladies preparing for a feast and they have a little helper. Next. Some of us going for a boat ride on the La Grande River at sunset. 
And here's my uncle checking his net for whitefish when we're down the coast. So helping indigenous people uh, is, is, is really needed. And to do that, we need to gain knowledge and respect for indigenous culture and traditions, understand their social problems, especially the residential school experience and multi-generational trauma that we see today. It's important to understand these mental health issues that we often see, such as depression, suicides, and substance use, and also to reflect on your own values, beliefs, and attitudes. Next. This is what most people think of Indigenous people, sad to say. Down and out on the, on the streets in Vancouver East Side, maybe down, uh, down in Montreal, in Toronto, you know, big, usually larger centers, but they're out there. Fortunately, they're the minority, but seem to be the most visible. Most people are not like this. And you can see in the top left is Brian Sinclair. He was a First Nations man who was in a Winnipeg emerge, had cognitive issues, um, past history of substance use, lost his legs to hypothermia, and was sent in by a family doctor to have a catheter change for a bladder infection. And instead of being triaged and seeing the doctor, he sat in a waiting room for 34 hours, slowly got sick, and more, more so uh, later on to, to be quite sick and eventually died in his wheelchair in the waiting room, never having received health care. Four bystanders told the staff there that this man needed help and no one helped him and he died. There was a lot of media attention around this case and his family largely believed that he died of racism. But the inquiry that was held only looked at the flow of patients through the emergency department. So there was a big mistake there. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he's not the only one that suffered from racism. Next. As you, as you know, Joyce Echaquan, uh, unfortunate death was a big tragedy uh, that was, was uh, in, the, in the media attention in September. And uh, I cried when I seen the video. I only looked at it once, but sadly to, to think that this probably will happen again somewhere, somehow, unless we help people to learn about Indigenous peoples and address systemic racism. Next. There's different types of race, racism and it's important for you to learn uh, what it's about um, and try to nip it in the bud, address it, talk to people, talk to your staff, learn about Indigenous populations, culture, and you know, talk about racism. Next. So since Joyce's death, uh, there has been many um, attention drawn to anti-racism initiatives. Um, and basically it's to reduce or remove the effect of systemic racism. And to do that, you have to, you have to start learning exactly what is racism. Next. So uh, just on the final notes, you know, in historic and current policies have major effect on in Indigenous health and that we have a disproportionate burden of disease and lower access to health services. It's very important to stop stereotyping assumptions, prejudice and racism in its tracks. And it's important to think of First Nations and Métis people as strong cultures with historical connections to the land that are ongoing. And this is a beautiful cultures that, that need to be explored and, and people need to learn about it. And also to help treating them using a cultural safety and anti-racism lens. Next. Remember, residential schools, racism and culturally unsafe care negatively impact the health status and outcomes of Indigenous people. Next. So what can you do? You've already taken the first step. You're learning today. And it's important to self-reflect. Remember what I said about cultural humility. 
self-reflection. And then you can understand, act, and advocate. And this, this is important for you as a healthcare leader. So you can carry this through to your staff and eventually have a frontline impact, a positive impact in the care you give to Indigenous people. It's also important to engage the communities around you because you can't do it on your own. You need to do it together. So just in closing, there's, uh, it's important for you to uh, learn about Indigenous patients because you become the advocates for them, uh, even in your healthcare leadership positions. Next. Here are some uh, references that you might find very useful. This document, First People's Second Class Treatment, was launched in 2015, and it also explains not only about Brian Sinclair's case, um, but some of the uh, descriptions about racism and also some good examples about how programs and services use culturally safe care to give services to Indigenous communities. Next. This is a document from the College of Family Physicians um, Indigenous Health Working Group. I am a co-chair for this. And this describes more, it's a quick fact sheet on systemic racism and what you can do at uh, the individual uh, level and also as, as, a, as a team um, or as an organization. Next. These are also some uh, references from the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, uh, also three other fact sheets. Next. So I wanna leave you with one story uh, that happened to me when I was training. Uh, I was doing an emergency rotation and um, you know, I was finishing with a patient, uh, writing my notes. And then this man was brought in on a stretcher and he's First Nations man, about 50 years old, um, known to the eMERGE for previous uh, presentations with alcohol intoxication. So he brought in uh, with his arms restrained to the side rails and he was all agitated, moving around, thrashing his legs, uh, looked sweaty and disheveled. And rather than going to get the next chart, I went to this man. Um, you know, I, I see obviously he needed help and the nurses were trying to calm him down. So I went to his bedside, I looked at him, he looked at me and uh, I said, I'm, I'm Dr. Kitty, can I, can I help you? He uh, recognized me, I think, as a First Nations physician, but he, uh, so he quietened down and uh, he, I said to him, you know, if, if uh, we take these off of your, the, off your arms, can we, uh, can I help you and, and will you stay quiet? And when he looked at me and he was looking at the restraints on, on his arms, he told me, I'm a residential school survivor. So I knew that this is very traumatic for him. When I think about this patient, I, I, I get emotional. So I looked at him, I said, I, I, I understand. So I asked the nurse to remove the restraints. I took one off, she took one off. And then I realized I have to help him. So I started asking him medical questions to find out what, what the problem was. So in fact, he wasn't drunk, he wasn't intoxicated. He had chest pain, trouble breathing. The nurse took his vital signs. He had low blood pressure, fast heartbeat, fast respirations. His oxygen saturation was down. And he, when I listened to his heart and lungs, he had crackles in his, in his lungs. And the ECG showed rapid atrial fibrillation. The nurse put an IV in and oxygen on his, on his uh, nose. It turns out while I was talking to him, the attending physician I was working with came to the bedside and heard him say, I'm a residential school survivor. In the meantime, when we found out he had rapid atrial fibrillation, this is a cardiac emergency and he uh, needed to be shocked 
have a uh, have a heart uh, his heart shocked because this is an unstable condition could rapidly deteriorate to cardiac arrest. So we rapidly prepared that together with my attending. We gave him one shock and he reverted back to normal rhythm and stabilized. His blood pressure came up, his pulse went down, his oxygen improved. And uh, we settled him down. I had to uh, prepare him for admission to, to the ward upstairs. Uh, so I was writing my notes and uh, my attending physician came to me and asked me, what's residential schools? And I was shocked by hearing that. How could an attending physician not know about this? This man could have easily died on the stretcher if had he waited longer for treatment, for assessment. But instead, I went to him to to help him and I probably saved his life. And I was shocked that I heard my attending didn't know it, but I was glad he asked because physicians must know this. Nurses must know this, other professionals and even administrators have to know it because otherwise what would happen if he was another the Brian Sinclair Agency Department. Then administrators would have to deal with that situation. So it's important to understand about residential schools and all the factors that affect Indigenous people's health. In the end, my attending physician and I sat down at the end of the shift and I explained to him about residential schools. So it taught me one, two things, that I had to teach more about this and that people have to learn it. So I always remember this man. Next. So I'll leave that with that story to think about. And uh, I, I hope you've learned something today that will carry you through to next part of your journey. Thank you. A huge thank you, Dr. Kitty, for sharing your experience, for helping us in our learning journeys about this history and the context um, and the things that we need to learn individually as, as providers, as teams, as organizations, as systems across the country. And lots of thanks in the chat, gratitude for what you've shared with us today and, and part of um, ongoing learning and discussions that will, will start today and will be continued going forwards as well. Uh, and thanks to everyone who has been sharing reflections, um, uh, Thanks to Dr. Kitty, also sharing some of the resources uh, that have helped you in your learning journeys. So I just invite you to continue to share reflections, questions, resources in the chat. I am going to hand over to Harmony Johnson, who's um, going to be um, sharing uh, more about the BC report and recommendations um, as well. And then we're going to come back to uh, questions um, in the chat and have a bit of a discussion with uh, Dr. Kitty and Harmony Johnson. So Harmony, over to you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Dr. Kitty. Um, hello, everyone. I'm joining from Tsleil-Waututh Territory this morning uh, in British Columbia, and I'll serve as Mary Ellen's humble substitute um, to talk through a few of the key findings in our recent report um, in plain sight, which was released on November 30th. And today we will be releasing the final report of our review, um, which is a comprehensive data report. So all of the um, evidence that we pulled together for this review. And that was really important um, for us in our methodology and our approach to this review was um, this is a topic that's highly emotionally charged for everyone. Um, Dr. Kitty called it the R word in her presentation, and that's that's so true, right? We all have a reaction to the word racism, whether that's fear of being called a racist, whether it's a triggering of an experience that we've had. And so it was important for us that, that the report we produce not be you know, an advocacy report, but be a very evidence-based report on the existence of racism in healthcare in British Columbia. And most importantly, situating that racism within a broader understanding of all of the factors that Dr. Kitty just outlined, the experience of colonialism and the impacts of racism um, on our health and well-being um, as Indigenous peoples and the impact of that on society as a whole. So this graphic that you're looking at on your screen um, is essentially the report at a glance. 
And we have a summary report that um, is like set close to 70 pages. We have a long report that's, you know, 250 pages. And then our data report is going to be another 250 pages. This piece was intended to try to simplify um, the, the line of argument that we were following and pursuing in the review. So what you see on this graphic in the top left-hand corner is recognizing that our people, Indigenous people come from a long history of health and well-being. Um, we have our own medicine, we have our own philosophies of health and healing, um, we have our own healthcare systems, and those were supporting our health and well-being since time immemorial. Um, the introduction of settler colonialism um, in Canada was intended to oppress and undermine those systems of health and well-being. And in order to do that, right, in order to create policy that does the things that Dr. Kitty talked about, residential schools, Indian hospitals, there has to be a narrative told to people about why that's okay. So what you see are these beliefs that are cultivated about Indigenous people, right? Well, there's kind of dying off, right? Or they're genetically inferior or they're culturally inferior. And those kind of beliefs created an environment where things like policies like the Indian Act and residential school um, are seen as socially acceptable. So that is the foundation on which our institutions are built. Our healthcare systems, our education systems, the systems of government are built on that colonial foundation, which is underpinned by those beliefs. And so as we move into healthcare today, which is again, one of those organizations, one of those institutions founded on that history of colonialism, we see these very common stereotypes. And so in our review, we directly connected with about 9,000 people in BC through a number of surveys, um, through key informant interviews, um, through a direct 1-800 line. We looked at data of um, 185,000 Indigenous peoples. So this wheel here represents a lot of data and evidence um, in behind it. So we did a lot of qualitative analysis um, of across a number of data sets. And what we saw loud and clear are a number of very common stereotypes that exist and are prevalent in healthcare in BC across all regions of British Columbia. And those are really very similar to those beliefs of colonialism that we think are 150, 200 years ago, but in fact have evolved and kind of underpin um, our beliefs in subtle ways today. So those are less worthy, right? Indigenous people are less worthy of care. Um, drinkers, alcoholics, and drug seeking, very common. The story that Dr. Kitty told us is, is, that, is that stereotype in action. Um, bad parents. Uh, non-compliant frequent flyers, um, you know, not quite as capable, can't seem to follow care instructions, get stuff for free. And then there's a whole series of misogynist um, views about Indigenous women and their bodies. So those were the common stereotypes that we saw presenting um, across the data we looked at. What is the, what's the impact of those, of those beliefs, whether we acknowledge we carry them or not, right? What's the impact of that on our behavior? Well, in some cases, there's abusive interactions. Um, in a lot of cases, there's like trying less hard. So there's kind of a denial of service. There's ignoring and shunning. Um, there's a lot of assumptions made and profiling of patients that lead to medical mistakes. Um, inappropriate pain management was very, very common. Um, and a disdain for cultural healing. So indigenous medicine, not as good or not as effective or not scientific, um, you know, stories of elders having their cedar bundles taken away. Um, that's not necessary in this facility. So like we see that discrimination happen and that's the experience, the common experiences, again, this is kind of pulled from our analysis that indigenous people are experiencing at the point of care in British Columbia. And this has two impacts. So when we follow the wheel, what we see is it moves from that experience of discrimination leads to poorer access and care. So there's a high mistrust of healthcare. Many indigenous people saying, you know what, I'm just, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna access care. Um, so we see less GP and NP attachment. And as a result, we see people with, um, you know, using emergency department um, as kind of a last resort. Um, we see unwelcoming environments for indigenous people um, in healthcare. 
We also see, so although the discrimination kind of carries forward in the, in the wheel, what we also know is that the very experience of racism and discrimination also has a negative impact on our health and well-being. So it's not just lesser access, but it's also um, the experience of racism is associated with higher rates of stress and distress, of higher suicidation, um, of higher you know, problematic substance use. All of this leads to poorer health outcomes. So um, lower life expectancy, higher rates of chronic disease, greater progression of chronic disease. Um, and what you can see here is that without understanding the wheel, without understanding how racism and discrimination leads to those outcomes, those outcomes are just feeding into those same old stereotypes, right? There's something genetically inferior. That must be Y, X, Y, Z. Um, and so our, our core um, effort in this review was about unpacking this cycle and understanding how do we then disrupt this cycle in positive and proactive ways to break this wheel um, that's occurring. So we looked at things like, we took a very, very strong Indigenous human rights lens. So we have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and in British Columbia that it has been passed into law in British Columbia through the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. So we definitely took a very strong human rights lens to say racism is absolutely a violation of Indigenous human rights. And additionally, in Indigenous people also have the right to access their medicine, to use their healing, to be acknowledged in their own territories and to be involved in decision making. So that was, those are the kind of key um, aspects that we pulled through from that UN declaration to think about um, interventions and recommendations that could disrupt this cycle. Next slide, please. Here are the main findings um, of our report. So on the left-hand side of the um, slide, you see that those are really like the problem findings. So I talked about widespread stereotyping, discrimination, and the impacts of that on health and well-being. Those are the first two findings of our report. The third one, as I noted, is the disproportionate impact on women and girls. If nothing else, I'm bound to determine for this one to um, get some attention in the follow-up to the report. Um, you know, kind of poorer outcomes. We know our women are navigating care for their grandkids, for their husbands, for their families, um, and they're bearing the brunt of that. Public health emergencies, COVID-19, and in BC, we also have a public health emergency on the overdose, um, opioid overdose crisis, both of those disproportionately impacting Indigenous peoples. And our healthcare workers and students are facing significant racism in their work and study environments. So although everyone we talked to said, you know what you really need to do in order to disrupt racism is have more Indigenous healthcare professionals. Well, the reality is that the learning and study environment is career limiting for them. So we have work to do. On the other side of the slide, we looked at solutions. So we took kind of a critical eye at, well, what are the things in place um, that are intended to address racism and how well are they working or not? And again, this is where we took a strong human rights lens. So. The current education and training, um, there are some excellent work kind of happening in pockets, but it's not mandatory and it's not helping people um, move beyond gateway understanding and awareness raising to what does this mean for me in my practice, whatever my role is in the healthcare system. So there's, it, there's not a, enough education that takes people through kind of a journey of lifelong learning um, and practice improvement. Complaints processes do not work. Um, well, uh, what we saw is the moment where our 1-800 line opened up, the floodgates were uh, um, kind of unleashed because people felt that they had a safe avenue to talk about their experiences. So there's work to do there. Integration of um, Indigenous health practices and knowledge. So again, our ability to use um, our knowledge and our medicines needs to be better integrated uh, within the system and opportunities provided for that. Um, we haven't used the main lever. So in, in BC, there's actually like we had tremendous cooperation through the whole review, leadership all on board, no issues there. Um, we have organizations all doing amazing independent little projects, like not criticizing that. But what we have not done is pulled the main levers that we have for change. So that includes things such as legislation, policy work. Um, regulatory standards and those aspects that really kind of make this hardwired and built into the fabric of healthcare. 
indigenous leadership um, throughout the system. So um, through this review, we have now have an associate deputy minister for indigenous health, um, Don Thomas from Sinanamo First Nation, and she's now the most senior indigenous public servant in British Columbia. Um, we need more indigenous people um, kind of visible and present in the system. And finally, no consistent measurement. So, and accountability tied to that measurement. So part of our work and the data report we're releasing today is intended to say, the evidence is here in plain sight. We just need to use it and, and actually be committed to measuring it on an ongoing basis and using that for improvement. This isn't a blaming and shaming report. This is about improving care. Next slide, please. So in the um, final recommendations of our report, we had 24 total recommendations and we took a very strong human rights approach, as I mentioned, recognizing this is a very complex problem. We also intentionally organize the recommendations by systems, behaviors, and beliefs. And these are all interconnected things, right? The more the system changes, we can help shape behaviors and beliefs. And the more that beliefs and behaviors change, we can push for systems change. So all of these need to be happening in parallel, but the most number of recommendations is in systems. Um, 10 total recommendations ranging from improved measurement, legislative change, um, improved participation in governance, complaints processes, et cetera. Behaviors focusing on what organizations can do to respond. So this is where, for example, we need increased focus on women's health. Um, in BC. We need increased focus on uh, the work that we're doing in health emergencies. Beliefs. We had four recommendations that focus quite a bit on training of the public and of health professionals, as well as creating a school for Indigenous um, kind of medicine, a co-degree with, um, with an MD program, as well as we're proposing for nursing. And then we had one recommendation focused on implementation. So again, today we'll be releasing the final report and we know that um, things are starting to, to move. It's been two months um, since we released the report. And so we're anxious to, um, everyone in the system is anxious to see some progress. And um, we hope that this report makes a difference in BC and that um, others across the country find some value for your particular contexts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harmony, and thanks so much um, for people who've been sharing their reflections and their questions and resources in the chat. Um, I'm just looking to the chat and to the questions and answers. And thank you, Dr. Kitty, for responding to some of those um, questions already in the chat. Um, I'd like to pick up uh, specifically on a question that came from a participant for, from Quebec, um, asking if there are any other resources um, or specific actions, uh, Dr. Kitty, that you would encourage um, leaders in Quebec to be thinking about if you have any responses you'd like to share. Hi. Um, there's many steps that, uh, you know, Quebec leaders can take. Um, and like I've said, it starts with knowledge. Um, but I think it's time that people self-reflect on what's happening in their own little healthcare system at their local or regional level. Um, we need to engage with Indigenous communities and populations either in your city or nearby and uh, start a conversation like, what, what can we do to help you? What can we do better? Um, the VN Commission came out uh, uh, almost two years ago now and uh, it made a series of recommendations. Uh, unfortunately, the provincial government, the premier, did not admit that there is systemic racism. And I think that by far is the biggest step to take before real change happens. Um, and you don't have to wait for the premier to admit it. You know, you can do it uh, at your local or regional level to, to reflect and say, yes, systemic racism is a problem for us. Let's do something about it learn more, you know, engage more and uh, call on your, your staff to, to work together and work with the Indigenous communities nearby. This goes also for not only Quebec, but everyone else too. Thanks so much, Dr. Kitty. I'm 
another question that has come through, and perhaps I'll ask Harmony to respond to this one first, is to please comment on including traditional healers in healthcare settings and maybe some examples or uh, resources you could point people to specifically uh, from British Columbia. Yeah, this is one where I think there is some um, good effort taking place in certain parts of the province. So we know that there are, um, for example, elders in residence programs that a number of the health authorities here in BC have um, have established. Uh, we There are some kind of blended primary care models where we have elders and knowledge keepers within the circle of care um, providing that support um, to patients. So it's, it's early days, but I think that um, there are promising signs. And what we really do have to do is systemically enable those to occur more broadly through things like making sure that all new capital facilities include the room and space for those practices. So I know, for example, the North Vancouver Island Hospital created larging, larger birthing rooms, knowing that when there's a birth in our family, we have lots of families showing up to celebrate that um, and want to be um, undertaking ceremony. So we, but we need to enable that. We need to say that that is an important feature of our healthcare system. And yes, we are going to pay for that larger room. Um, we need to create policies that allow for um, the exercise of um, certain practices. So I think it's like, again, this is where the problem can, we can get stuck in the problem because we think it's too complicated, but we just need to kind of move systems and people kind of together um, through that journey. So um, again, I think there's some good work done and I just wanted to put a quick plug in for um, the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, who I think is going to be creating a national repository of tools um, and resources about the good things that are happening so that that can spread and, and support quality improvement across the country. So it's early days, but I think that type of um, resource is critically important. Thanks so much, Harmony. And I know Dr. Kitty had included, I believe, uh, the link to the National Collaborating Center in her slides and resources. Uh, and they will be uh, shared with participants following today's session and also those links to resources um, that our speakers have, have shone a light on uh, will be posted to the website with the archive of today's session. We're just about moving towards wrapping up, but Dr. Kitty, is there anything you'd like to add to what Harmony shared in terms of specific um, resources uh, beyond what we've already talked about that you would point people to? There's there's so many resources out there. And um, one of the things that I uh, encourage people to uh, learn more is, and not only learn more, but also to change their mind, change their attitude, change their approach to helping Indigenous people. And this would be... Uh, not only reading academic articles or finding resources, uh, and hopefully these resources are indigenous led, but also uh, find some resources that will vi you can visualize what indigenous people are really like. Uh, one of the things that I encourage, uh, well, that I've developed with one of my staff at uh, the University of Ottawa is the Indigenous Health Resource List. I could send this to you, uh, Maria. Um, it's basically an eight pager list of references that uh, you could learn more about Indigenous people, Indigenous health. And it's not only um, academic articles, but books, fiction and nonfiction, uh, movies, documentaries, um, that highlight, you know, what it's like as an Indigenous person facing a situation. Uh, for example, there's a movie called Necessities of Life, and it shows an Inuit man being taken away from his community to recover from tuberculosis in the South. And uh, eventually he recovers and goes home, but he has a long recovery. And it's a really great movie to see. It's very touching. And you can really appreciate what Inuit people have gone through. So that's just one example. So if I can send you the list and maybe, uh, you know, for, for the audience here, you can read the list, learn more, and also, you know, learn from these other uh, resources that, that show Indigenous lives uh, firsthand. And yeah, they might be movies, but they're often very accurate. And I've seen most of them and, and they're very good. So there's documentaries. Um, there's also uh, um, books uh, that uh, either fiction or nonfiction that uh, are, are well written. So uh, I'll do that and then 
you know, you can you can see and reflect on them and talk talk with someone about it, you know. That's another way to learn. Thank you so much. And thank you for that generous offer of sharing the resource uh, list of resources that you've curated and put together with us and that we can make that available to participants on today's call and to participants networks and colleagues and teams who I know um, from looking at the chat feature, they're looking forward to sharing today's presentation um, and session with, with as the recording becomes available. Um, so we are at time. I feel like it's just the really the beginning of a discussion and we could have spend much more time together and we, we look forward to time to do that. Part of my reflection and the reflection of our organization is that um, as part of our learning journey and learning about what the road to reconciliation looks like and the role we have as a pan-Canadian organization uh, with the opportunity to partner and work with and for more people across the country to include, improve um, patient safety, cultural safety, um, and humility. We have lots of learning to do. Uh, we look to be guided by the perspectives of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And we think our role is to create opportunities like this for safe spaces, for learning, uh, for discussion, for reflection, and for sharing of resources. So more to come from our organization as well. A huge, huge thanks uh, to Mary Ellen, uh, to Harmony, to Dr. Kitty uh, for joining us and making today possible. And a thanks to our participants for joining, for sharing some of your reflections and, and deep gratitude, uh, Dr. Kitty, Harmony, and Mary Ellen for your time and sharing your experiences today. So let's move forward together and do better. Um, using data and stories and experiences to drive improvement uh, across our country. That concludes our session. Huge thanks to everyone. Take care.